Hey, what is up, y'all? It's your boy Dak, also known as the SJSU Duck, and welcome to episode two of the Duck Pond, a series where I'll be bringing to you the biggest news in the world of Spartan athletics in the last week. So if you like San Jose State sports or are just simply a fan of the Mountain West, hit that subscribe button and I plan to make frequent videos in the future. I know it's been a while since I've last uploaded an episode, which is four weeks to be exact, and I would like to apologize and blame Christmas, New Year's, and my vacation as the reasons why. On that note, hopefully you all were able to view my social media accounts as I wished y'all a Merry Christmas and a New Year full of amazing things. But anyway, like I promised in the past, I want to make this a weekly series and I will eventually decide on a consistent upload day in the future. It's currently 3am on Friday, the 21st of January in the year of our Lord 2022, so there's a chance that more news will come out by the time you see this video. Enough babbling, let's get into the meat and potatoes of what has happened in between the last episode and this week. First and foremost, I would like to say rest in peace to former San Jose State Defensive Coordinator Greg Robinson, as he unfortunately passed away earlier this month at the age of 70. It was beautiful to see Spartan Nation gather around and honor his contributions to our team, as the support on social media was incredible. He will be missed. Starting off today's episode, I will be talking about the in-season sports right now. With it being January, Spartan basketball has already gotten into the full swing of things. Beginning with the men's team, the last upload I made recapped their exciting 78-66 win against the University of Pacific. As I uploaded that video, the boys tipped off yet again up north in Portland. The word dominant would be an understatement as the Spartans blazed our West Coast Conference opponents from beyond the arc as an at the time program record of 17 three-pointers was made and propelled the boys to a 90-78 win. Trey Smith had a game high of 24 points while hitting 8 three-pointers in the game and this feat matched Noah Bauman's program record set in 2019 against New Mexico. Trey Anderson and Omari Moore recorded double-doubles as well which were enough to boost our boys past the finish line. It felt like this win gave our men's team a much needed confidence heading into a matchup with our crosstown rivals, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. Although Sean Robinson collected his first double-double with 16 points and 12 rebounds, our efforts were not enough as five Santa Clara Broncos players scored double digits in order to stampede us out of the building. This marked the first loss of the season at home and officially ended the Spartans' non-conference schedule. As we hope to use this game as fuel to the fire entering our first conference game, some unfortunate news popped out of the Spartan camp as a COVID issue was made known. As time passed, the game against Nevada on the 29th was canceled, followed up with our New Year's Day matchup against Utah State being postponed as well. This meant that the men's team had to wait two and a half weeks before any game action. But thankfully, the program was able to control the COVID issue and the Spartans were now set to take on the Lion Angels of Bethesda University, an NCCAA school located in Anaheim. Quite the mascot name, I guess. There wasn't a reason to sleep on this team as the Lion Angels defeated D1 opponent CSU Northridge in their game prior. Thankfully, the Spartans were wide awake and absolutely speared our opponents from down south. This game saw us set multiple program records which included 33 team assists along with 23 pointers made, which broke the previously set record of 17. The gap in competition was made obvious as the Spartans emptied their bench before the conclusion of the first half. This game was highlighted by the play of Myron Amy as he scored a career high 32 points on 13 field goals made. Tibet Gornair also tallied a career best 23 points in only 16 minutes. The final tally resembled a fantasy football score when all of your players are on IR as we took the bread 118 to 43, which is a 75 point gap for those of you who do not want to do the math. Sadly, as I'm writing the script for this episode 13 days later, this was the last time we'd see a Spartan W. The Spartans looked to use this momentum heading into conference play, but unfortunately, this didn't go quite as planned. To start off Mountain West action, our team traveled down to Fresno to take on our Valley rivals. I wasn't able to watch this game in its entirety, but by the looks of the box score, Fresno took home the bread comfortably as we dropped the game 79-59. Trey Anderson led the team in scoring as he collected 18 along with Omari Moore contributing 11 to the cause, but Fresno rode the back of Orlando Robinson as his 31 point and 12 boards left the Spartans in the mud. Later that week, the Spartans hosted an absolutely talented top 25 Colorado State team with the hopes of pulling off an upset. Unfortunately, I can say that we got rammed as after Colorado State took the lead with 18 minutes left to go in the first, they never looked back. Going into the half, I actually believed that San Jose State was doing okay, but the second half performance by our visitors from Fort Collins was just too much to overcome. The Rams took the bread and heck, even came back for seconds as we lost 78-42. Omari Moore led the team with 15 points and Josh Ogaro scored 10 getting valuable playing time off the bench. If I can encapsulate the game in 6 short seconds, it would be this. Have a great weekend. Fortunately for us, we had a quick turnaround as only two days later we hosted the Running Rebels of UNLV. 
I thought we fought pretty well to start off the game as we trailed by single digits until the 8 minute mark of the first. It seemed like UNLV was getting everything to fall in as in a blink of an eye, we entered halftime down by 15. From then on out, the run-in rebels definitely ran all over us as they ended the game with their guns smoking. 81-56 was the final tally as our foes from Las Vegas took the bread. A positive coming out from this game is that Myron Amy showed his worth as he dropped 23 points off the bench. This young man is proving to us every game how good he will be for the future of this program. Shout out to everybody on the UNLV team though as they seem to be a good sport and love my suffering in the student section. We get another crack at them at the end of this week as we travel to Las Vegas on the 22nd. Hopefully we get a positive result. Lastly, the Spartans hit the road on the 19th in order to face off against our opponents from Laramie. I was only able to catch the second half of this game but by the looks of it, we gave Wyoming a run for their money. We kept it close throughout the game as the score was deadlocked at 55 with 11 minutes left in the game, but whether it was the altitude that got to us or simply just the strength of our opponents, the Cowboys went on a hot streak in the final 11 minutes, outscoring us 29-14 as they lassoed the W from the Spartans, winning 84-69. Four of our players scored double digits as Omari Moore, Sean Robinson, Trey Anderson, and Tibet Garnier helped in the scoring column. Hopefully the boys can take that first half performance into the game at Las Vegas on Saturday as I believe that this was some of the best basketball that we've played in the last four games. As we experience this four game skid, I would like to bring the statistical side of things into the frame. As an offense, we put up 68.8 points per game, and although we're only 8th in the conference, our scoring average is higher than possible tournament teams like SDSU and Fresno. But unlike those two, our defense has allowed 71.6 points per game, which makes us the third worst in the conference. This gap in numbers gives us a negative 2.8 margin, making us dead last in the conference. What I'm trying to say here is that our defense has to tighten up if we want to be better in the future. It's not good to witness how in the last 4 games our defense has given up 40 points per game inside of the paint. It also doesn't help how due to Ibrahim Diallo's injury, we've had to result to small ball. Sure we have another center in the team in Harmander Dalawal, but I don't think Coach Miles will give him any extended minutes anytime soon. With 12 games remaining on the season, I hope that we can use the UNLV game as a turning point. Although it's obvious we aren't a Mountain West Championship winning team yet, we can see that Coach Miles is steering our program in the right direction. In Miles, we trust. Well, now that we're caught up with our Spartan men's team, it's time for me to transition to our ladies and get caught up in their action. In the last episode, we covered their narrow 77-64 defeat to UC Irvine on December 15th. The ladies would have an opportunity to build off of that defeat as they hosted the Lady Gauchos of UC Santa Barbara on the 21st. The ladies kept it close in the first, but after putting on a shift and outscoring us in the second quarter 20-6, UCSB gained separation and never looked back. Unfortunately, I've got no idea what a gaucho is, so I can't make a play on words like the other games. So I'll just let it be known that we lost to UCSB 51-81. Megan Oberg led the charge as she dropped 14 points, followed by Stephanie Torres' 11. Illa Lane led the scoring for the gauchos as she dropped 26. Our next meeting against the Lobos of New Mexico on the 28th was postponed to January 24th as COVID concerns in our camp grew which doesn't really make sense considering that we played three days later against Nevada, but I'm no doctor. Anyway, let's talk about this Nevada game as we played tremendously throughout the first half. We went into the break trailing by seven and playing good team ball, but unfortunately, we couldn't keep it up as we went ice cold in the second half. The Lady Wolfpack team ended up mauling us 83-48 to as they outscored us 47-19 to in the final two quarters. This was very frustrating to watch as I felt like we didn't deserve this result but the better team won and I'd rather not cry over spilled milk. Deja Ross led the team in scoring with 11, and Sydney Lewis notched a double-double with 10 points and 11 boards. Deja Hamilton of Nevada dropped a game-high 21 points on an efficient shooting night. Due to COVID problems in the Fresno State camp, the game on January 3rd was postponed and moved to the 13th. This news was also followed by a COVID problem in the Wyoming camp, as they postponed their January 6th matchup with the game we play yet to be determined. This meant that the ladies would have a one week break prior to traveling to Fort Collins to take on the Rams of Colorado State. The game got out of hand real quick as after the start of the first quarter, Colorado State held onto the lead for the rest of the game. Sydney Lewis was red hot as she scored a team high 24 points with Deja Ross tallying a season high total of 19. Unfortunately, outside of those two, there really wasn't much offense as they accounted for 67% of the team's scoring, while Colorado State had four players in double digits led by Upe Atosu's 32. Although we cut their lead to 14 at the end of the third, a 30-point fourth quarter rammed Colorado State across the finish line as a 90-64 win sent our ladies home. With the Lady Bulldogs rescheduling their game to the 13th, the ladies would return from their road trip to face off against Fresno State twice in three days. The first matchup took place in the event center on the 13th. Going into halftime of that game, it was a close one as Fresno only took the lead midway to the second. But as the case was for many games in the past, 
we fell apart in the last two quarters as Fresno State dogged their way to a 78-57 win. Ella Oguier played flawlessly as she dropped 18 points on 5 boards. Deja Ross also remained consistent dropping 9 points going 3 for 6 beyond the arc. But Fresno State's Haley Cavender and Watala Morris had 23 points each as they were absolutely automatic during the second half. The Lady Spartans would have another crack at the Lady Bulldogs two days later as the second leg of this matchup would be in Fresno. This second matchup was much more entertaining than the first as the Spartans made adjustments from the matchup that happened two nights before. After three quarters of play, the Spartans trailed 51 to 55 heading into the final quarter, but unfortunately for them, the ladies of Fresno State made key buckets down the stretch in order to hold off San Jose. Another late surge by our opponents resulted in a 74 to 87 loss to the female dogs. Megan Oberg and Ella Oguier had 19 points each as they made bucket after bucket for the Lady Spartans. Hannah Cavinder scored a game-high 24 while her twin sister recorded a triple-double with 17, 13, and 13. Unfortunate that they just happened to heat up when they were playing us. Four days later on the 19th, which was two days ago, they were back in the event center to face off against a fantastic UNLV squad. Going into halftime, we trailed the talented Lady Rebels team by only one point. But just like every other dang game I recapped, we fell apart in the second half. We were outscored 44-25 in the second half as UNLV pulled away to win 74-54. Megan Oberg and Ella Oguier continued where they left off as they were in double digits yet again. UNLV was led by 24 from Alyssa Durazo Frescas in an efficient second half shooting night. That leaves us here on the 21st of January where the Lady Spartans travel to Colorado to take on Air Force tomorrow. Fingers are crossed that we can get back into the win column as we are currently on a 10 game slide. Now that we're officially caught up in the basketball world, I can finally head elsewhere and tell y'all what's going on in the rest of Spartan Athletics. Firstly on our list, we got women's gymnastics as they opened their season earlier this month. After an impressive showing in their Denver meet, the Spartans catapulted to a 9th place national ranking. This is due to scoring a 195.950, the second highest score in school history. Jada Missouri and Lauren McPherson impressed as they led their team to victory with their flawless performances. In fact, Missouri's performance was so impressive that she was named the Mountain Pacific Sports Federation Gymnast of the Week. This was important as just a week later, the Spartans traveled to Oregon State to take on the Beavers and the Washington Huskies in a try meet. Unfortunately for us, we finished third in the meet and our ranking plummeted to 32nd nationally. But this doesn't mean that we had a terrible day. The team scored a 192.725, being led by Jedi Lopez and Emma Milne. Oregon State and Team USA gymnast Jade Carey stole the show, as she won first place for all five events. In the end, Emma Milne's performance for the Spartans proved effective, as she was honored as the MPSF Specialist of the Week. Although I'm a complete bonehead when it comes to gymnastics, I'm excited for the future of these Lady Spartans. Flipping into our next sport, I'll be talking about our indoor track and field team. On the 6th of this month, 9 athletes signed their NLI to join SJSU for the 2022 season. Fast forward to the 15th of this month, SJSU opened their indoor track and field season in Spokane, Washington. 9 Spartans started off the season strong with new PRs, and this is nice to know considering the fact that we will be traveling to Albuquerque on the 28th in order to compete against a Mountain West foe in New Mexico. Hopefully all goes well for our track and field team. Hurtling into the next sport, the baseball team released their 2022 schedule on the 7th of this month. As stated on the athletic website, 30 of the 56 games will be at home, including a 12-game stint to open up the season. The opening day date is set for February 18th as they host the Mavericks of Nebraska Omaha at Excite Ballpark. The baseball team also seems to have wrapped up fall ball recently as they look to improve on a sluggish 2021 season. This effort will be aided by 23 new players joining the squad, 15 of which are transfers. According to the notes on the Spartan website, Charles McAdoo and Theo Hardy are improving greatly from last season. I can't wait to see the Spartan baseball team in action for my first time coming this February. Hating it off to the other diamond, the softball team announced their 2022 schedule yesterday on Twitter. In contrast to the baseball team, the softball team will be starting their season on the road in Sacramento as they face off against Montana on February 11th. Then they will travel to nearby Palo Alto to take part in the Stanford tournament before returning home on the 25th of that month. Hope to see them go crazy this year. Pitching it over to the water polo team, the girls start off their season today as they head to UC Santa Barbara in a three-day invite. A rather daunting task awaits them as three of their five opponents are ranked top 20 nationally, but I don't think this will be a problem considering that we're, in fact, ranked 16th in the nation. So hopefully we can get some fireworks to start off the 2022 season. Treading over to the golf course, news released that San Jose State women's golfers Natasha Andrea Un and Antonio Malate received invites to play in the 2022 Augusta National Women's Amateur Tournament taking place on March 30th. 
What a great achievement it is by these two, and hopefully this has gotten your Spartan pride flowing. Teeing it off to the tennis courts as the women's tennis team are set to begin their spring season at Fullerton today, as they will head to CSU Fullerton to take part in a three-day tournament. I'm not too knowledgeable about our tennis team, but I hope that we can get off to a strong start. Serving it over to the volleyball courts, we've got news of a departure according to the Transfer Zone's Twitter account, as freshman outside hitter Cora Turquil has entered the portal after not featuring for the Spartans this season. If these rumors are made to be true, then best of luck to her and wherever she decides to bring her talents to. Lastly, setting it to the football team, Assistant Athletic Director for Football Operations Ben Tynes has received the 2022 Football Scoop Operations Director of the Year Award. His job includes overseeing and managing the football team's daily operations, scheduling future football events, and communicating with the constructors of the new Spartan Athletic Center. Congratulations to him as his hard work has finally been recognized. Elsewhere in the football news, I have made a video a couple weeks back talking about the arrivals to the team, but I forgot to talk about the flip side, the departures. Prior to this month, three players entered the transfer portal. Chance Johnson, EJ Ane, and Sinjin Astani all entered in December, but have not decided on a destination yet. Talented wide receiver Isaiah Holiness also entered the portal and committed to the University of Massachusetts. Fellow wide receiver Andre Crump has also entered a couple days after him, committing to nearby FCS school UC Davis this week. As painful as it is to see them go, I wish each and every single one of them good luck on their future teams. And breathe. That was a long episode, but we finally made it to the end. I finally caught you up to date with what has happened in the world of Spartan athletics between my last episode and today, and I guarantee you that these episodes will be much more shorter in the future, so hopefully you stay tuned. My sources for today's video were of course the wonderful Spartan community on 247 Sports, the Transfer Zone on Twitter, and of course the SJSU Athletics website itself. If I missed out on something or if you would like to know more about something I brought up in today's episode, Please leave a comment or DM me on any of the social media platforms I have listed in the description. This episode took 6 hours of research, 1 hour of recording, and 1 hour of editing, so I would really appreciate it if you like, commented on, and shared this video as well as hitting that subscribe button for future uploads. Stay blessed everyone, this is Dak also known as the SJSU Duck signing off from the pond. See you in the next one, Spartan up, and get that bread.